All right, good deal. Hey, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 2. But it'll be the last verse of 2, and then we'll head into chapter 3. But uh, anyway, guys, I have, uh, I have kind of dedicated, and I, I think I'm going to slow down a little bit because uh, I, wa- I want to be able to cover a few other things. There's some things I just really want you to understand. <clears throat> to me, it is so powerful. This book uh, was, is so powerful because it... it it's, it's total desire. Paul's total desire in writing it was to keep the gospel the gospel and to keep it from down through the centuries from, from uh, spinning off into all kinds of stuff, you know, all kinds of, you know, whenever you start trying to, what I call grace additives, you know, when you add things to God's grace, you need, you need what Christ did, right? Or you need God's grace, but you also need this and you also need this and you also need this. Uh, it's amazing how weird it can get. I mean, really weird. Because everybody has different agendas, everybody has different thoughts, everybody has different, hey, listen, this ought to be, this ought to be, this ought to be. But when you have a purely grace model, that is, it's purely a gift, it keeps everything pretty pure, which is the reason for the book of Galatians. It was written because Paul had gone into an area called Galatia, and he'd shared the gospel, and their lives had been changed. Uh, God had changed their lives. But then a group came in behind them and started adding, yeah, but you need, yeah, but you need, yeah, but you need. And a lot of their stuff was, was, was Jewish stuff, like, you know, like, like circumcision, like the Sabbath day, right? Kosher foods and all the stuff. You got to have this, you got to have this, you got to have this, you got to have this. And pretty soon, you know, their good, their good news uh, began to be burdensome, right? And they're what Christ did became not as important in reality because you have to do these other things too. So it's just powerful. So the entire book, the entire book is about what is the gospel and, and, and the difference it makes in your life. Now, two things I want you to pick up on today. Um, number one is, is the gospel and how one becomes a believer. It's by grace through faith, right? That's the thought. That's the, the foundation, really, of the whole Bible, right? That is how one becomes a believer. So if you're not a believer today, right, and if you're at home and you're not real sure if you are, again, it's not about being religious, as we'll see again today. It's about has there ever been a time in your life you've understood the gospel, and which is who Christ is, what he came to do, right? And because of who he was, he could do what he did. And therefore, those who respond by faith, and then God changes their life, and their life changes, that's, why, that's how one becomes a believer. But the other important, very important part that I'm wanting you to pick up on the next few weeks is this whole thought of learning to live in that freedom that comes by his grace. You know, a lot of people may become believers, but a lot of times it's, it's, a, it's a, if you will, it's a, it's a longer road learning to live that way. It's one thing being free, but it's another thing learning to live that way. And I will tell you this, that the greatest testimony to our world that you can have is to learn to live in that freedom, right? To live in that freedom. But that takes some time and understanding, and it takes some, some really understanding of what it means to be a believer. Now, there's a couple of thoughts I have I want to throw at you. And how does one grow in their faith, right? Seriously, if you are a believer today, how does one, how do you grow in your faith? How do you do that? Don't answer it out loud, obviously. But there's only about 100 books on that, right, in the Christian bookstore or online, right? How does one grow in their faith? And if I was to ask you, if you are a believer today, right, if you're not, then we'll get to you and you'll be able to understand because that's the main reason. I just want you to understand. But how does one grow, right? How does one grow in their life as a believer, right? So if you ask yourself that question, right, what do you think? And most of the answers you get or a whole list of stuff, right? How does one, how does one, how does one get close to God? And there's about 200 books on that one, right? I've got a weird answer for you, but it is the correct one, right? There's only one thing that makes you closer to God, and that's what Christ did at the cross. Period. Right? There's nothing else that makes you closer. Right, because what Christ did, 
He drew you to who God was. And if truly what the scriptures teach about it is that he now lives within his spirit, which is what we're going to talk about today, then that's as close as you can get. Now, well, well, Jeff, well, sometimes I just feel closer. Well, yeah, feel closer. That doesn't mean closer. That just means you have, you feel it. So, so we may need to grow in understanding who he is, right, and his presence. But remember this, he's promised to never leave you nor forsake you, Scripture teaches. But also, there's only one thing that makes a person close, right? It's not about anything you do. Now, you may do things that, that help you help you in your awareness. But again, remember, remember when we, when you, when you really latch on to this understanding of what grace is, it will really keep you from finding yourself burdened and bound to different little systems, right? Different little things, right? It's an incredible thing. So so again, I got a couple of things that I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna be talking with you about over the next few weeks. But when the scripture says this, all right? It only says it a bunch of times, right? But when the scripture says to, here we go, to grow in grace, what does that even mean? Right? Please don't answer it out loud. What does that even mean? Oh, it's just a religious phrase, whatever. No, no, why does the Bible say it so much, right? But what does it mean? How do you grow in grace, right? I'm not going to tell you, right? I'll tell you, I'll tell you in a few weeks. But I want you to see that. I don't have time, by the way. I will give you a hint, though. If grace truly is a gift you don't deserve, then you need to grow in the understanding of the difference he's made in your life, right? And the more you grow and understand and know him, the more you'll be able to trust him, and the more you'll be able to trust him and understand what he's done for you, and then gratefulness and all kinds of things begin to grow. It's an incredible thing, right? If you truly get and understand what the message of grace is, right? And what it is not. So today's title, all right, is a little cumbersome, all right? But I just, I couldn't improve on it. By grace through faith and not works, all right? Because I'm telling you that I know as I've shared this with you over the last few weeks, but what I am saying today would really, would really upset people, right? Because everybody has their traditions. Everybody has their church that grandma grew up in, right? And, you know, and well, that's kind of what I've always, listen, if you really want to understand what the message of the scriptures is, then look at the scriptures. Not what you're told what they say, but what they say. And, you, and you'll, you'll be, you, it'd be remarkable what you see. So this is what we're, we're going to doing in the book of Galatians. I just want you to see, hear, and understand, right? Because it is a powerful thing. Now, so, so I had visions of sharing a whole lot of going, getting a long way into it. We're just not going to get that far today uh, because that there's one thing you really need to see. There's one thing you really need to see. So remember, there's two things, two goals I have for this series through Galatians. Number one, I want you to understand what it means to become a believer, right? So there may be some of you, many of you, that, that if you want to know what that means, it's not joining a church, it's not denominational stuff, it's not the list they add to it. There's really just one simple thing we've been talking about. Number two is, as a believer, I want you to learn to grow in that grace. I want you to understand what it means to grow in him because the greatest testimony you can have as a believer is to learn to live in the freedom that is already yours and to learn to start giving up on trying to earn what God's already given to you for free and just learn to live in the freedom of it because it says later in Galatians, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. And so that, since that was the reason, then the greatest testimony you can have is learning to live that way. It's a powerful thing to understand and to see. But boy, nothing in this life, right, promotes it. Why? Because everything you've ever had in your life, you, you, you've had to either perform for it or work for it or, or, or whatever, right? A free gift is a hard thing to comprehend and understand, right? So anyway, so we're going to spend the majority of our time in the, in, in the first. I only have a couple of things under this thought. Number one is personal experience, and number two is scriptural evidence. And I'm going to finish up this morning with just the last few minutes with the scriptural evidence. But I want you to see what Paul says here in the first, in the first, few, in the first verses of chapter 3. But we're going to begin 
in chapter two and take a look at verse 20. All right? This is last week. This is where we finished up last week. I just want you to see a couple things, right? And again, if you like writing in your Bible, you know, or highlight or whatever, I'm gonna give you a couple of things here that'll help you, that'll help you really get what he's saying. All right, here, this is. All right. Paul says this. Now, I, I did tell you last week, first two chapters of Galatians are, are just Paul's personal, they're personal, right? The, the chapters three and four, which we're beginning today, are more of a teaching thing, right? And chapters five and six are the practical application of it. So it's pretty cool. So we're just getting into just the teaching part. So you'll see, you'll see, just want you to hear what Paul says here, right? Christ, uh, but Paul, again, still in the personal part, he says, I have been crucified with Christ, right? It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Now, don't miss this. I have been crucified with Christ. All right, what happened at the cross? All right, because of who Christ is, right, God with us, he was able to do what he did, that is to give himself on our behalf, take our penalty, our punishment, whatever. And so this is what Paul's talking about. When, I, when, when he was crucified, it, it, it was I, I was, right? And it's no longer I who live, right? This is, therefore, Paul's desire is to be who God's called him to be and the difference that God's made in his life through Christ, all right? Now, listen, this is interesting. Do not miss this, because this can be confusing, right? It's no longer I live, he says, but it's who? It's Christ who lives in me. And that becomes a common theme throughout the New Testament. The difference that God makes on the inside as I've shared with you so many times, it's an inside work. It's not just some, you know, religious ritual or religious little, you know, things that you do to try to clean up the outside. That's what the Pharisees did. It was an inward change, right? And it's that inward change that is the hallmark of what it means to be a believer, according to what the scriptures teach us. So Paul's talking about, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live is not Christ. It's not I, but it's who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And he says, in the life I now live in the flesh, that is this physical body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So therefore, life change that comes in a person's life, life change that comes in their life is his work in them. And that, you know, so many times people think that, well, if it's purely about grace, then, then people can do anything they want to if they, you know, if they get their fire insurance or whatever. But guys, I haven't seen that. If he's changed you from the inside out, then you're not the same person you were before. If you're the same person you were before, there's been no change. And if there's been no change, you're not his. Am I making sense? You see, you'll see it, it's as clear today it's as clear today in this passage as you can imagine, right? right? Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God that is canceled out. For if being right with God, that's what righteousness means, came from obeying God's commands or obeying the law, then, then Christ died for no, no reason, no purpose. So here's the thought, right? If by your good works you can be right with God, then there wasn't a purpose for Jesus to come and do what he did. The only reason Jesus came to do what he did was because there was no other way. This is as clear as it gets, all right? Now, which this bleeds us into chapter three. All right, here we go. Oh, oh, foolish Galatians, all right? Who has bewitched you? Now, this is not a sorcery kind of witchcraft thing. Uh, this is who charmed you, you know? It's kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like giving a kid a piece of candy, you know, or, uh, you know, somebody saying, oh, you weren't taken in by that, that smile and that sad story, were you? So when you talk about being charmed, that's the thought. In other words, he's saying to these Galatians, guys, are you kidding me? Those people came in and charmed you into no, basically turning your back on everything you know to be the truth because it sounded good is basically kind of what he was saying. He said it was before your eyes. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. In other words, you understood not only who he was, but you understood what he came to do. 
Let me ask you only this. In other words, Paul says, I have one question. The difference that was made in your life, did it happen after you trusted him? Or did it happen after you started trying to obey the, 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 the works of the law? Well, they didn't even know what the works of the law were. They were mostly non-Jewish. They had no idea. And yet God changed their life because he, they trusted him. They trusted his word. Right? So this is powerful. So just one question. Did you receive the Spirit? Now, this is, this is huge. I've decided to kind of spend the rest of my time right here because I think, I think, it's, I think it's desperately needed to be understood. And since this is kind of the teaching part of Galatians, there is an element that's, there's an understanding that is needed. Right? But it... And it is some of the most abused, the most abused, if you will, teaching, you know, if you're a believer, you know exactly what I'm talking about, is this whole thought about, about God's Spirit, Holy Spirit, however you want, whatever you want to call, whatever you want to call it, right? But I want you to see this. So, so did you receive the Spirit? So Paul is talking about a, uh, something that has already happened. I don't miss this. He said, so when God changed your life, that is his spirit came to live within. And that is the teaching, guys. That is, that is the mystery. And you'll hear the mystery in just a little bit in a minute. There is a mystery to this, right? right? It's just not purely a religious thing where you follow you know, a whole lot of rules and all of a sudden your life changes because you're following rules. That's not it. It's an inward change. There is something that happens to the person and it has been down through the history Right? The Christian experience, that is, the change in, in people's lives down through the history has been the thing that has puzzled everybody the most. Religious stuff is easy to explain. Oh, well, they just got religious and they started doing a bunch of, ro- you know, a bunch of rules, a bunch of stuff. But when God changes your life, the people around you realize that that's not the same person that used to be there. Right? If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. That's profound, by the way, isn't it? Right? If you know what I'm talking about. Okay, good. All right. So he just asked them the question, hey, Galatians, when God changed your life, was that because you trusted him or was that because you're, you're doing so good now? They knew what it was. I know what it was. I've been in church all my life until I was 21. But when God changed my life when I was 21, it was obvious. Right? It had nothing to do with me trying to be a good person because... I stunk at that, right? I really did. I mean, some of you are good rule followers. I'm not one of them, all right? You know, in fact, you rule followers don't really even like people like me, all right? And I, I mean, now, obviously, God's changed my life, but at the time, so, so how did it happen? So Paul's asking them, I just need to ask you one question, all right? Since you're jumping on this works bandwagon, how did you become a believer? Because you started working hard or because God changed your life? Are you so foolish, he says, having begun by the Spirit, that is, have the change in your life, but now I'm going to try to grow, that is the process of growing, maturing, perfected, it's all the same thing. I'm going to start doing that in my own power and strength, in my own effort. That's why I ask the question, how do you grow in your faith? If it's about stuff that you do, right? Then you're going to struggle, all right? You're going to struggle. He goes on to say, did did you suffer so much in vain? See, in other words, they became believers. God changed their life, and they they were persecuted for it, right? They were persecuted for it. He said, indeed, if it was for in vain, he says, look at verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you, right? Don't miss this. Because this is this right here, this right here is what we're talking about. We're talking about that great, that great mystery. We're talking about that, that, that work that he works within. Guys, now that I've been doing what I do now for a long time, uh, I've learned several things. And Number one is the passion, I've told you this many times, the passion I have is just to make things understandable just so you can understand it. But I have also learned this. 
when God allows you to see, when that, there's, there's rarely a service go by that I don't pray and say, Lord, God, open their eyes and let them see it today. Because I have learned it's not, it has very little to do with me. Because I have seen so many different things. You know, the person up here can be a terrible speaker, a terrible communicator, a terrible orator, whatever you want to call them. And yet if they share the truth, even if it's terrible, if God opens a person's eyes and lets them see, it doesn't matter how bad this person is. Their life has changed, not because of this person, but because they can see. And yet you can have the greatest orator up here that entertains everybody in the room. Yet if God's not at work, people leave talking about how great the speaker was. Okay, what good is that? Nothing. So then you and I are dependent on something that has a little mystery to it. And it's this right here. His spirit working within. That's what I want to talk to you about today. That's what I want you to see. All right? All right. So does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do so it because you're working so hard? Or does he do it because you heard his message and you trusted it? All right? So the question is clear. So this is what I want to talk about today. All right? We're just going to take the rest of the time just to talk about this. All right? The Holy Spirit's work. You know, I have to give you a couple of cautions here, right? Number one is don't put a separation there where one doesn't exist, all right? Because Paul said, right, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So it's synonymous with his spirit that lives in me. So there is no separation Yet there is a distinction, and I, that's where, where it goes beyond the ability to explain. Right? Now, Holy Spirit's work. And this just comes from the scriptures. I'm just going to give you different parts of the Bible of, of what this looks like. Right? Number one, one of, the, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is, is to convict us of, of sin. That is the inner understanding of our own guilt right? over our own sin. You know, you live in a world now that is trying its best, especially in the academic world, but other places too. They're trying its best to try to even do away with the notion of sin. In fact, it's almost considered, you know, just so yesterday when I even talk about it, right? But remember this, the scripture teaches it. It was the reason Jesus came. And until somebody understands that they are indeed a sinner, they will never see their need for Christ, ever. That is why the world around you is just trying to, because we all live with this guiltiness, but it's better to live in fantasy land, right? It's better to live in fantasy land and say, well, no, everything's fine, right? You know, there's nothing wrong with me. You know, yeah, I make a mistake every now and again. no. No, oh, that's not what the scripture teaches. And it's God's spirit that works in a person's life, if and when he's working in their lives, to convict them of that, that fact. All right, let's take a look at it in John chapter 17, excuse me, John chapter 16, verse seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. This is Jesus talking. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. So Jesus had told his disciples, hey, listen, I'm going away and where I'm going, you can't come. And they got real sad, where are you going? Don't leave us, that kind of thing. And then this is what Jesus said. Nevertheless, listen, I'm telling you the truth. It's better for you if, if I'm gone. Because as long as I'm here physically, because Jesus was God incarnate, right? God in the flesh. And Jesus said basically, and, and obviously his spirit is, is, is different and it's sometimes hard for us to comprehend and explain. But this is what Jesus is saying. It's through your advantage I go away. For, for if I don't go, all right, all right, if I do not go away, the helper, which is just another comforter, is calls at times, but it's just is another thought of, of, of God's spirit, right? Holy Spirit, right? Helper will not come to you, but if I go, I'm going to send him. So this is the, this is as good as I can explain it. 
But Jesus is Emmanuel. Most people don't have any idea how important that term is, and we talk about it all the time at Christmas time. It means God with us. That is, that him which is eternal and invisible is present. It's a powerful concept, God with us. But Jesus says it's only temporary, right? Because it's imperative I go away because as long as I'm with you, I'm God with you. But when I go away, I'll send the comforter, right? Holy Spirit. And it won't just be God with you, it'll be God in you. So this becomes the powerful teaching part of what he's talking about here, right? right? But, when he com- but he, when he comes, what is he going to do? Look at verse 9, right? Excuse me, verse 8. When he comes, he'll do what? He'll convict the world concerning sin. So one of the great works of God's Spirit, right? In fact, I've even gotten to the point now to where I get letters. I mean, people are offended when you call them a sinner, I mean, seriously, that's where we've gotten today. But I have learned I can't convince you of that. And I can't convict you of that because it's not my job. I tell you, a lot of pressure was lifted off of me when I realized it's not my job. Right? It's his job. And if he doesn't do that part, there's nothing I can do. I mean, I can maybe yell and scream, which I'm not ever going to do, but unless I'm excited. But I'm not going to yell and scream at you and tell you who, you know, the, how terrible you are when... That's God's work. He's, he lets you know who you are. And when he sees it, it's, when, when you see it, when he convicts you of it, you see it, it's huge. Because it's what drives you to him when you can see who you really are. I call it one of the best, worst gifts you'll ever get. Right? I know it doesn't sound good, but it is good. Because it, it allows you to understand need. Right? It really does. And he goes on to talk about the rest of righteousness and judgment, which all comes together. That's part of, that's part of, God, of this God's Spirit's work, right? Number two, rebirth is another thing. Through faith, by grace, through faith, right? And I talk about this all the time. I've been talking about this a lot recently. And guys, I just, again, just as I share this with you, just look at, what I, the, at the scriptures I share with you. Therefore, his Spirit's work is to convict concerning sin, but it's also to change people's lives. Convict them of their sin, and then those who respond by faith, he changes their life, right? Uh, being ones in Christ, they are a new creation. I talk about this all the time. But there is an event, there is actually an experience as a believer, right? And the scripture teaches it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. But one of the clearest ones and most powerful was by Jesus himself, right? So I want you to see God's Spirit's work in this particular area of a changed life, right? This, if you will, dead in your trespasses and sins, but made alive in Christ. Regeneration is another term that's used. You take a look at all of them. It all speaks to a change. Not, not someone who all of a sudden got religious and started doing weird things which happens often, by the way, but an actual change. Now, let's take a look at what Jesus said. The the words of Jesus, I'm not making this up. I've actually had people say, oh, that's not in my Bible. I said, well, go get your Bible, right? Wherever it is, go get it. And let's, let's, a lot of times people think this is, it's because they don't go back to the source and find out what does it say. Well, let's see what Jesus said, all right? Now, there was a man of the Pharisees. And his name was uh, Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. That tells you a lot, right? Nicodemus uh, was one of the most intelligent men of his age, of his area anyway. He had the equivalent of two doctorate degrees. Number one, uh, in, in religion, if you will, and number two, in law, right? Because he could not be a ruler. He couldn't be on the Sanhedrin, which is the version, common day version of our Supreme Court, right? So this guy was smart, this guy was religious, this guy was intelligent, and this is the other thing that really baffles people. Uh, It's not about intelligence. It's about God letting you see. I hope you're hearing me. 
Sometimes some of the most intelligent people I have run into don't get this, right? They, they think you're an idiot because if I can't understand it, because I'm so smart, if I can't understand it, then it must not be true, all right? But at least Nicodemus didn't go there because he was in the room with Jesus and he knew there was something different about him and he wanted to know. Isn't that interesting? That's, how the, that's why the Bible can say, you know, that he's using the ignorant things in this world to confound the wise. Because if you've taken an, a, t- a very intelligent person who's blind, right? But if you take someone who's not intelligent at all, but they can see, there is a difference. But it's amazing how this intelligent person, right, will begin to doubt that this ignorant person can really see it all. Because I've never seen, and I'm smarter than you. Am I making sense? I think you're getting it. So it's a change, it's an inside change. All right, so here's what Jesus did. There's there's this man, right, very smart guy, and he comes to Jesus, take a look at verse two. This man came to Jesus by night as to avoid anybody else seeing him, right? And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher, right? Come from God, for no one can do these things you're doing unless God was with him. But I'm having a problem catching on to what you're saying. And then Jesus in verse three just stops him cold and says, basically Jesus answered him and says, truly, truly. Now remember, every time Jesus said a double truly, that it's, you need to really hear this. Now, if he said truly one time, okay, you, you do need to hear this, but, but a double one means, okay, I'm about to say something profound, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, and he looks at Nicodemus, he says, unless one is born again, he can't even see the kingdom of God. So Jesus is talking about an experience, a change experience that is reflective to physical birth. Right? That's about as big a change as, as can happen when somebody is born physically, right? To everybody involved. Right? But Jesus is sharing that there's something that happens and that it must happen or you're not his. Right? This is why I say at times, you know, because used to, it doesn't happen as much anymore. But but it does at times because you don't hear this phrase as much. But I used to have people ask me, you know, are you one of those born again Christians? And it is, this is why I would say to them, guys, there's no other such thing other than that, right? If you're, if you're a Christian at all, you're a born again one because Jesus said it so. Just need to hear this. this again, it's not what I'm saying, it's just what it says. If, if you, unless you're born again, you won't even see the kingdom, Jesus said. And then Nicodemus doesn't get it. He says, how can this be? You know, how can this be? How can a man be born when he's old? He doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. Can he enter this womb of his mother a second time, right, and be born? And Jesus said, here we go, double truly. All right, Nicodemus, you're not hearing me. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that means physical birth, right? And of the Spirit, capital S. So there is a change, a transformation, an awakening, uh, I mean, it's, it, eye-opening, whatever you want to call it. It's been called so many things down through the centuries. But there is a change that happens. But Jesus says you have to be born twice, right, is what he's talking about, if you're his. It's an incredible thing when you begin to see G- what Jesus was talking about. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So in other words, at physical birth, then the, again, the, the person, a person is born. But that which is born of spirit, spirit. In other words, that's his work. He goes and says, don't be amazed, Nicodemus. Don't be amazed that I said you must be born again, right? Why do you marvel at that? And here's the mystery part. Okay, Jesus even shares that it will be a mystery to us. He says, the wind blows where it will, right? And, and you hear it sound, right? But you don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it's going. So it is with how God works in people's lives that are born of him. Some of the most unlikely people 
that God touches their lives and lets them see and they, you just scratch your head. You know, Lord, if I'd have changed somebody's person, if I'd have changed somebody's life, it wouldn't have been that person, you know? But it's an amazing thing. But there's a mystery to it. It's like the wind, he says. You don't know where it's coming from, you don't know where it's going, but you know when it's there. Right? But there is a mystery, and I don't get it. And this was real hard for Nicodemus. Because he, he had his own little religious system, man. He, he had this all figured out. This, I mean, I mean, my, my, my mother was this way, my grandmother, my great-grandmother. This is how it's always been, you know? And Nicodemus says in verse 9, he just can't get it. If you can feel the emotion of this story, feel Nicodemus saying, that can't be true. Right? Because Jesus, what you're saying is, is that everything I have done my entire life has been wrong. All of the stuff, all of the, the education, all of the religious stuff I've done, what you're telling me is, it has nothing to do with any of that. How can this be? It's a powerful statement. When you understand what he's saying, eventually, believe it or not, Nicodemus becomes a believer. God changes his life. It's an amazing story if you truly understand it and understand that there is a mystery and a work on the inside. It is what set me free as someone who does what I do. Used to, I just used to take so much personal, you know, because I would, I would try my hardest, right? But I have come to understand Unless God is at work in a person's heart, I can, I can turn flips. I can do crazy stuff up here, which I'm probably still going to do it time to time. But I have learned that when God opens a person's eyes, that's what we want to do. That's what we want to see. That's what wants to happen. We're not looking for cookie-cutter religious people. We're looking for God to change people's lives, and only he can do that. Pretty good stuff when you begin to understand it. Therefore, you and I are totally dependent. So therefore, the greatest weapon you and I have in sharing Christ with others, evangelism, or whatever you want to call it, is prayer. Because it's his work in their life, not how well you share it. Interesting, isn't it? If everything changes when you get this grace picture, by grace through faith, and how his spirit works in a person's life. Number three, his, work, his, his spirit works in every believer. Right? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? So there's, here's the picture. The temple in the Old Testament was always a picture to the Jewish people, to the people of Israel, of God's presence with them. In fact, whenever so when Solomon built the temple and God's presence came to live in, in the temple, it became a picture of God's presence with the people. But when Jesus said, hey, listen, I'm going away and it won't be God with you, it'll be God in you, then you have become the temple. Therefore, he's changed your life and he lives within. So it's a powerful concept, but it is what the scripture teaches. And if you truly are his today, his spirit lives within. It's basically what he's saying here by this passage, All right? whom you have from God, and you are not your own, you've been bought with a price, right? Number four is to be filled with the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? No, oh, that's interesting. If he lives within, then there is a way to be filled. And, but what does he mean by that phrase, filled? Well, the greatest explanation of it is found in Ephesians 5, right? And it says this in Ephesians 5. It says, don't, and don't be drunk with wine, right? I don't know if you, where I'm from, you don't ever get to the second part. Everybody just loves to talk about that one. All right? But he said this phrase for a reason. And you and I need to understand what is he talking about as believers, if you are a believer today. What does it mean to be filled? All right? Don't be drunk with wine, but, which is debauchery, he says, but be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? All right, well, let's just... Again, I've learned just to simply ask yourself the question, well, what does it mean to be drunk? Well, that's an easy one, right? All you have to do is go find some alcohol somewhere. And if you drink just a little bit of it, 
there's a little bit of a change, but not much. But if you're filled with it, all right, if you're filled with alcohol, then amazing things happen, all right? It's amazing how brave someone can get when they're not ordinarily brave. Uh, it's amazing how stupid somebody can be when they're filled, making awful decisions, getting behind the wheel of a car and driving, right? Saying things you don't mean, hurting people that you love. And in reality, you probably wouldn't do it if you weren't filled with it. I'm not, I'm not trying to convict anybody. I'm not trying to hit on anybody. I'm trying to get you the concept of what does this mean? It means to drink enough to where it has a huge impact in your life. Does that make sense? It's a powerful concept. When you really get it, you go, that is what that says. You know? Because those that live within, in other words, know him, understand him, grow enough to where it begins to affect what you say. It begins to affect what you do. Hopefully to the good, right? Hopefully to the positive, hopefully others. So that's what that means. All right, I've got to be done. Believe it or not, that was just number one, all right? Number two, and this is where I'll close because this will be real quick. But the scriptural evidence, and this is where I'll pick up next week. But I'm just going to give you one look. Galatians chapter three, verse six. Paul gives the scriptural evidence that what he's saying is true. What he's telling them is true. And he goes back to the foundational one that God started all this with. Way back, way back in Genesis chapter 12. A guy by the name of Abraham. And there's a verse in Genesis chapter 12 from the Old Testament that says this. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So Paul is quoting from Genesis. And he's saying, listen guys, this is not something new, right? This has been with us all the time. It's just been clouded by religiousness, right? You see, God promised, God made pro promises to Abraham. And the things that made those promises true in his life because Abraham believed them, right? And then it was counted. In fact, it says in some of your translations, credited. In other words, it was given to you. You didn't earn it or deserve it, but because you believed it, it became true in your life. It's a powerful concept when you begin to see it. Therefore, it's not because Abraham was such a great guy. It wasn't that he, he didn't, he, he, you know, he was real religious and real other thing. Most I read about him, he wasn't that much at all. He lived by himself with a bunch of sheep, mainly, if you read his story. But the one thing he did do is he trusted God, and God changed his life. Not because he was a good person, but because he trusted God. And that's what he goes back to, and this is what we'll pick up next week. But it's a powerful concept, guys. It's liberating both to those who are not believers and those that are. Guys, if there's never been a time in your life you've trusted him and you've seen your life change, then understand, I do, I don't even know how this works, but I just know that it works. But if God's at work in your life and you wanna know, if you wanna know what it means to know him, then I want you to understand that all you have to do is trust him. I don't even know all what that entails, but he's promised that anyone who comes to him, he will not turn them aside. Again, great stuff if you'd like to know that. But if you are a believer here today, right, and you're finding that your life as a believer has become burdensome, or you feel like you're a failure, right, we're gonna be talking about this over the weeks. I hope you'll be here, because I think it'll free some of you up from trusting yourself to be the believer God's called you to be, as opposed to let him work that in you. For those of you who have ears to hear, I hope you can hear me say that out loud. You don't have, the best you can be as a Pharisee, right, in your own strength. It's his work in you that makes the difference. How does that work? Well, that's what the 
rest of the book of Galatians is all about. It's pretty exciting stuff. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll have a closing song. Lord, thank you so much for today. God, thank you for your incredible love for us. God, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. God, we're grateful. This time is yours. If anything good has happened, God, it's because of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless.